and I appreciate you um, being here this morning, and uh, what a blessing. We're going to stay in Mark 1. I, I was there last week, and uh, the book of Mark is a, is a blessing. Those of you that, of course, are uh, was here last week and know my took a team of about 20 people, 21 people to Israel. Just uh, We got back last week, and uh, we had a time. I mean, we, we had a time. And so some of these places that we're reading, especially in the gospel, I was just... I was just there, and that brings it to life. I mean, it, it, it takes it from black and white and puts it in color, and it makes it very lively, and I appreciate what the Lord has done there in my life and just the Gospels. This passage here records one of the most powerful, amazing miracles that our Lord ever did. Matter of fact, only two times in the Gospels does it ever say that Jesus healed the lepers. Now, one in, in Luke chapter 17, He heals, the, you know the story, the the, the ten lepers, and he heals those stories. But then here in Mark chapter 1, he uh, heals this leopard individual, and I love this story as well, love the story of the ten lepers. And, and really, if he deals with, if you go back to Matthew chapter 11, uh, healing the lepers was one of the signs that Jesus actually mentioned himself that proved uh, that he was the Messiah Mark, in Matthew chapter 11. So leprosy was something that, that our Lord uh, said that he would do, and he did in Luke 17 and in Mark chapter 1. In this wonderful account here in Mark chapter 1 uh, about this healing of this leprous man, we are given a glimpse of the heart of the Savior. We see His compassion. We're allowed to see how much He loved this individual and the power of God on full display. I thank God as I was reading this uh, just a few weeks ago and studying and etching out some notes, I was thinking about this encounter with this leper and how that applies to our life. And I want you to notice that. And uh, you may not have leprosy this morning. Uh, you may not be uh, here with a skin disease and, a, and, and, and uh, rottenness and, and de de uh, just deformed by, by uh, this disease. That may not be you, but we all have the problem of sin. And uh, we all have that. We're all sick uh, with sin. I want you to notice verse 40 in Mark chapter 1. The Bible says, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. We see a sick man. This man is sick because the nature of his ailment. The Bible calls this man a leper. This disease in our day is known as Hansen's disease. It's actually a curable disease today. But in the Bible times, uh, this thing called leprosy was an incurable disease. And, and uh, man, it was highly, uh, man, it was highly contagious. And anybody that contracted uh, leprosy, uh, there was no cure for it at that time. And, and nobody in Bible times uh, feared any other disease more than they did leprosy. Leprosy was a terrible disease. Matter of fact, leprosy affects the whole body. It affects the whole body. It usually begins with fatigue and pain in the joints and, and scaly spots would develop on the skin. As the disease progressed, the, the body would then be covered with pus and filled uh, nodules. It would be a terrible looking, deformed uh, looking thing on your face or on your body. The appearance of the face would be altered. Some say that it resembled a lion because your face swells and it deforms and nodules would grow on the vocal cords so you would have a raspy voice all the time and the body would be in a state of living decom uh, decomposition uh, where thus a, a terrible stench would uh, seep through the pores of your body and uh, you could smell someone like death like like they were dying like a dead body but they were living it was a very terrible disease leprosy attacked the nervous system and it and comprises the whole body's ability to feel pain it acted as an anesthetic uh, numbing the body so they could never feel pain. That means if, and there's a danger to that. They, they could hurt themselves, they could step on something and it gets infected and they not know that they're in trouble, not know that they needed to go see a physician and then they would have infection settle in and before you know it, their foot would be uh, off and it would have to be gone or amputated. It would be a terrible, terrible disease. It usually ran its course. Someone normally lived about nine years with this disease, but the sufferer usually died a very horrible death, very painful death. One of the worst things about leprosy was the social isolation. You were not allowed around society. They had what they called leper colonies. 
You could only be around people that have that disease. The Levitical law was very clear that a leper was very, uh, they, they had to be away from society and had to be uh, to their own lepers. And there were some commands for the lepers. By the time Jesus came on the scene in the New Testament, the rabbis had added many more restrictions to the law governing these lepers. If a, le a leper even stuck his head inside of a home, of where someone lived, that home was now considered unclean. You couldn't even be around it. And it was against the law to greet a leper. So when it was determined that a man had leprosy, they would banish him from the village. He was no longer allowed to have communion or fellowship with other people. He had to leave his family. He had to leave his friends. By the way, they would usually have a funeral for him, even though he was still living. He could only get within 50 to 100 feet of an individual. If the wind was blowing that day, he was forbidden to be out in public. The leper had to tear his garments so that people would recognize that he was a leper. He was to dress as a mourner going to the funeral uh, of his own funeral service, if you will. He had to cover his mouth and had to wear a cloth so that he would not contaminate. And every time he saw people coming, he would have to cry unclean unclean. That would warn people so that nearby so people would actually pick up stones and if this man approached them he could they could actually stone him to drive him away. See in the Bible leprosy is far more than a disease. It also is a type of sin. It's also a type of sin. This this leper was considered the embodiment of impurity. Uh, this leper was living, breathing commentary, the own effects of sin. And no one here has leprosy in this building today, but everyone here has a problem of sin. Leprosy is deeper than the skin. If we go to Leviticus chapter 13, we don't have time to turn there, but leprosy is deeper than the skin. The outward manifestations of sin are merely just a window of the heart. The Bible tells us that it, it, what, what's on in the heart uh, usually shows up on the outside, and that's exactly what, uh, what leprosy is. It goes way deeper than just a skin disease. Leprosy starts out small, but it usually spreads, according to Leviticus chapter 13. Just a little spot, a little freckle on the inside of the palm of your hand is typically how it started, but then it is spread throughout your whole body. What a picture of sin. If we were to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11, you would see the life of a man who sought out God. He was a man that after God's own hearts, what the Bible says, it was a, a man by the name of David on one little sin, one little thing that David did, one day when he should have been out to war, David actually slept in that day. He gets up, he looks outside the, the banister on the balcony of his kingdom, and he sees a woman by the name of Bathsheba, and she's taken aback. He lusts after her, and he says, I want that woman for me. I don't care who she's married to, don't care who it is. And it was the wife of Uriah. Bathsheba goes because she obeys the king. If you don't obey the king, you die. She comes, and of course they commit adultery, and then on top of that, David now has to try to cover his sin, so he has Uriah murdered. Adultery, murder, a man after God's own heart. Where did it all start, preacher? It started with a little sin. That's what leprosy does. By the way, if you don't deal with those little sins now, they turn into big sins, don't they? Listen, I know, I, I know that every sin is big in the eyes of God, but you know what I'm talking about. If we don't deal when things are small, they will get big, they'll fester, they'll, they're infectious. And by the way, they affect other people. They affect your family. Dad, it affects your family. Mom, it affects your family. It affects your marriage. It affects your relationships. I had a conversation with a man just in the foyer just a little bit ago. We were talking about someone that we're praying about, not gossip, but him and I are praying uh, specifically about some... Uh, and, and I said to him, this started months and months and months ago when one little thing led to another. He said, Preacher, you're right. I said, man, I've seen it coming like a freight train. I've seen it coming. No, you know, when you're in it, you don't see it. You don't take advantage. Hey, oh, I wonder what that is. Well, I'll just see if it gets any worse. Oh, no. Deal with it now. Deal with it now. Whatever it is, deal with it now. You say, well, I'm just looking on the computer just a little bit. I, I don't plan to stay there long. Hey, no, 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 no. No, get rid of it now. And it'll turn, it'll bust your marriage all to pieces. It'll break up your, it'll hurt your children. It'll hurt your relationships. Deal with it. 
A little drink may turn into alcoholism. A little petting on a date could turn into something that you're not wanting to uh, down the wall. Listen, all kinds of things lead to bigger things if not dealt with. And leprosy, listen to what leprosy does. Leprosy defiles everything it touches. Everything. According to Leviticus chapter 13. Verses 44 through 46, when a man was stricken with leprosy, he was totally and thoroughly defiled. Sin has a way of poisoning a person's entire life. It will poison your family and your relationships. It will devastate and ruin everything that it touches. Ask Achan if a little sin. Achan who tried to hide those things, those Babylonian garments and all those things that was forbidden. He said, oh, I'm just going to get away with it. I'll just bury this underneath my tent. What did it cost? It cost other men their life. Little sin. Deal with it. Now, the altar. Talk to God about it. Hey, the Bible says we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hey, listen, we have a forgiving God. He shed His blood on Calvary and that blood washes away our sins. Hey, let's confess them to God and deal with them. Leprosy isolates, according to Leviticus chapter 13, verse 46, the leper was isolated from the camp of the clean. Leprosy destines things for fire. You had to burn it to get rid of it. You had to burn all the belongings. Leviticus, I want to read this verse to you. You don't have to turn there. But listen to this verse. According, dealing, the whole chapter is dealing with leprosy. Leprosy... Uh, is found in Leviticus chapter 13 and verse 52. The Bible says, He shall therefore burn that garment, whether warp or woof, in woolen or in linen, or in anything of skin, wherein the plague is, for it is a fretting leprosy, it shall be burnt in the fire. You know where our sin has us destined to be? In a place with fire. It's where we deserve to be. I deserve to be there. You deserve to be there. But thank God for grace. Hey, I deserve to be in hell today. I don't deserve to be in this pulpit. I don't deserve to go to this church. I don't deserve to preach to these wonderful people. Hey, because of my sin, they're, they're, I deserve to go to hell. But thank God for grace. The only way to deal with leprosy is to deal with it with fire. That's how God set it up. So we see the, the, uh, the nature of this ailment. It's a terrible disease. We see the nature of His approach because... What brought this poor man to Jesus, perhaps he was waking up that day and he heard the news that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. He heard the words that someone might have said, maybe if Jesus did that with those other people and healed them of their infirmities, that Jesus might do that for me. Doesn't that give you hope this morning? Doesn't that give you hope that can you imagine the reaction of this crowd when that leper got up that day with those torn garments and maybe a hand already withered and, 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 and he has it covered up because it's so gruesome to look at. Maybe his face all devoid. You see him walking up and Jesus is over there maybe touching some people and healing some people. All of a sudden, the man has to say, unclean, and boy, it parted. People running, they're scattering, and there's the man. Jesus fixes his eyes on that leper looks at that man and surely some of the fellow lepers that day as he tried to approach Jesus probably, probably tried to discourage him. They might have said, you better just stay here with us. Jesus don't want to help you. He doesn't care about your uh, wretch like you. Uh, but faith had awakened in his heart and that man for whatever reason believed that Jesus could do something about his infirmities. That's the way it works. The Spirit of God arouses faith in the heart of a lost person. And when a lost person comes to Jesus, the devil might say, you're not worthy to come to Jesus. Guess what? He's right. Your own heart may say, hey, you're not worthy to come to Jesus. Guess what? Your heart is right. But don't let that stop you from coming to Jesus because you might not be worthy to come, but we're made worthy by the blood of Christ. None of us are worthy. Hey, that man wasn't worthy that day. Hey, but guess what? We have a gracious, loving, heavenly Father hey, that cares about us. I thank God for that. We see the nature of His appeal. This man came to Jesus the right way. He came humbly. Notice what he, what he did there in verse 40. Beseeching Him and kneeling down to Him, saying unto Him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. You know, this man, he knelt down. He didn't come up there all prideful and cocky and arrogant, boasting. Man, this man was sick. This man was a diseased man, and a man that was an off-scour. Why would this man come proud to God? 
why would any of us come proud to God? He came humbly. The Bible says in Psalms 51 verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken... What do we just sing? I come broken to be mended. I, I'm, I'm a broken... and All of us are broken individuals. We all have things in our past. We all deal with things in our, in our present. And we all have things we'll deal with in our future. We're all broken people. Why in the world would any one of us go to God in a proud and haughty way? He realized that he deserved nothing, but he knew enough about Jesus to know that if the Lord wanted to, he could heal this body. See, when this leper speaks, he acknowledges the Lord's power, the Lord's sovereignty. Notice that little phrase there in verse number 40. He said, if thou wilt. That statement acknowledges the truth that the healing rests within the will of God. I want you to notice that if your life, church, listen to me, if your life has been wrecked, and ruined by sin, you need the divine intervention too. If you will come to Christ with a humble spirit and with the heart of faith, He will not turn you away. He will not turn... Listen, He will not turn you away. Guess what He'll do? He'll do the exact opposite. He'll turn you around. He'll turn your life around. Some of you this morning, if I were to have you stand up and testify about the goodness of God, how He's turned your life around, how you used to be a drunk, how you used to be a drug addict, how your life used to be a wreck, how you used to beat your wife, or you used to run around, or you used to do this or that, or cheat people, or steal. And then when God saved you, He turned your life around. Turn, that's what He does. He's the God, the great physician, we see the sovereign Messiah. Look at verse 41. And Jesus moved with compassion. Thank God. Jesus could have thrown this man away and said, no, you're diseased, but He was moved with compassion. He put forth His hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. We see the compassion. You say, what's compassion? Uh, compassion is a word that we refer to as a feeling of deep sympathy or sorrow of another who is stricken with misfortune accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. Then Jesus did something very strange. We're told that He put forth His hand and touched Him. He did the exact opposite of what most people would do. No, not most, everybody. I can, can you imagine the gasp for a minute? They're looking at it like, what's going to happen? This leper is actually talking to Jesus and Jesus is talking to him. And, and, and whoa, I'm afraid Jesus may catch this leprosy. Hold on, first of all, he, can, he overcame all the diseases. Amen? Uh, there, there was no disease, no worry there. But then he does something even more spectacular. He reaches out and touches a contaminated man. Touches this man. And when Jesus touched this man, his touch said, I love you just like you are and I'm here to help you. Oh, that touch said a lot, friend. Hey, I don't know, you know, it, it may seem childish to you, but one of my favorite songs is Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. For the Bible tells me... You say, preacher, where is it say in the Bible that Jesus loves us? Hey, He didn't just say it, He showed us. Right here, touching this man who nobody wanted, touching this man who was eat up by diseases. Others would have never touched a leper out of fear of contracting this disease. But Jesus, the cleanest man in the entire crowd, He didn't fear defilement. He touched Him without fear. By the way, deity cannot be defiled. Did you know that Jesus is still touching lives today? Do you know that? I believe we have some testimonies in here today of Jesus' touch. See, it makes no difference who you are or what you may have done. You're not so bad to go beyond His glorious touch. When Jesus came to this world to die for our sins, He entered our world. He shared our pain. He shared our suffering. He died on the cross and took our sin upon Himself that He might touch us and change us by His grace. We see the Messiah's command, because notice what He did. Look at verse 41. He put forth His hand and touched Him and saith unto Him, I will be thou clean. Look at verse 42. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. See, 
we see the, the Messiah's command because Jesus simply touched the leper and gave a command for him to be clean. Instantly, the leprosy departed. That deformed body was made whole. Instantly, the face was normal again. The shattered hands and the shattered feet were restored to wholeness. And the ruined skin instantly was made smooth as that of a baby. Instantly, the defilement of the disease was taken away. That's exactly what Jesus did for you and me. Instant salvation. We're not working on it. We're not trying to get salvation. Hey, when He saved you, He saved you instantly. You're made a new creature. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I thank the Lord for that. Everything changes when the Master speaks. Everything. No longer an outcast. No longer uh, out there saying you're unclean. and No longer that. Guess what? You're welcomed into the Beloved. You're in the family of God. But here's the third thing I see this morning is this, and I'm done. Look at verse 43. The Bible says, And He straightly charged him and forthwith sent him away. Now after this man's healed, He strictly gives him some directions. And then in verse 44, And saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way and show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in the desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. So this man gets healed. Now let's before we're hard on the man, can you imagine that everything about you was messed up? And then there's this man, Jesus, who touches your life and now you're different. You look different, you feel different, you are different. And then Jesus says, now I don't want you to tell a soul. But go to the priest and first I want you to be cleansed so you can go to the temple there. Let's get this certificate of cleansing so you can worship, so you can sacrifice. You know, they can't allow you to go in that temple and defile that temple. Uh, you, you need to go in there and get cleansed first. He didn't say never tell nobody. He said, I want you to do this first. What's the man do? He goes and tells everybody. Jesus wanted to tell that man this to avoid a, a circus-like atmosphere around his ministry. He wanted people to follow the message instead of the miracles. Jesus didn't send him away. He sent him to the priest, to the temple. And, and this man was to, told to go fulfill the requirements found in Leviticus chapter 14. The leper was to come to the priest, and the priest was to go outside the camp where the leper was. And by the way, that's exactly what Jesus did for you and me. When we could not go to the priest, when we could not go to Him, He came to me. He couldn't go in that temple, but guess what? That priest, when he knew he was out there, he came out to where he was. And I'm thankful that Jesus came to where I was. That's exactly what He did. Here's what the priest would do. The priest would then, in order to make this man cleansed or give him a certificate of cleansing, according to Leviticus chapter 14, this priest was to take an earthen vessel, two birds, some cedar and some hyssop, and he was to kill one of those birds and let the blood of that bird pour onto that earthen vessel. Then the priest would take the blood of the dead bird and he would apply it to the wings of the living bird. He then took the living bird, and with the blood dripping from the wings of the living bird, he would set it out open into an open field, and he would let that bird loose, and that bird would begin to fly up in the air. And as soon as the leper seen the blood dripping off the wings of the bird, he would understand the price of his cleansing, and the message would come to the leper, I'm clean because of the blood. And guess what? Hey, we're not sending out doves today or birds today with blood on it. Hey, 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross and shed His blood. And because of the blood, you and I are clean. Excuse me, I'm a little excited. 
There's only one element that can cleanse us from our sins today, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, well, my sins, they're, they're so deep, but the Lord says, my blood goes much deeper. Uh, some may say, well, Lord, my sins are, have gone too far, but He says, my blood goes so much further. Uh, they say, well, my, my sins are strong, but Jesus says, my blood is so much stronger. 1 Peter chapter 18 and 19, I love what it says about the blood of the Lord Jesus. Uh, listen, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. Man, I tell you, there's some that look at the blood and they think, oh, that's a gory religion and you're talking about... But let me say, hey, that blood's a beautiful blood. Hey, that blood's a perfect blood. Hey, that blood is what washes away our sinful, wicked, vile sins that we have been forgiven. Hey, it's been about the blood from Genesis. It's about the blood all the way to Revelation. Amen? And I thank God for the blood of Christ. And we see the disobedience here. Now notice this kind of has an interesting turn on this chapter. The story doesn't stop because in verse 44 the Bible says, And He saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go... Thy way show thyself to the priest and offer thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter the city but was without in the desert places and they came to him from every quarter. He, this man was to go and to show himself to the high priest. Notice what Jesus says that would be for a testimony unto them. This is the first recorded cleansing of a leper since the days of Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 5. And so he wanted to show that as a testimony according to the Levitical law in Leviticus chapter 14. Sadly though, Brother Jacob, you can make your way to the piano. Everybody listen. Sadly, this man does the opposite of what Jesus asked him to do. I, you know, I... I've heard preachers preach this all kinds of different ways. And they focused on the miracle, but today, and yes, we thank God. Man, thank God for the blood. Thank God for Jesus touching this man. But I don't know if that's really the message. The message was this man now is made whole. But instead of obeying what the Lord said, he does his own thing. See, church, look at me real quick. There's more to the Christian life than just salvation. That was just the beginning. Some of you in here have been saved by the blood of Christ. You're as saved as I am. You're as saved as anybody. But you're not in obedience. You would rather go out and just say, you know what, I know Jesus told me to go to the priest. By the way, I don't see where He goes to the priest at all. He goes out and just tells His buddies, hey, guess what? Man, look at this face. Man, look at man, look my my legs, my feet, my hands. Look, Jesus did all that. Hey, go tell it. Boy, everybody just and Jesus sees what's happening. People's running to him. And he's like, I gotta go. Now here's the deal. How many more people would have Jesus healed if that man would have obeyed? If that man would have obeyed, how many more people could have got healed? But because of one man's disobedience. Many people left that day unchanged. That'll preach. If we are not obedient, listen, I can apply this all... I, I about fell. I can apply this. That was... Woo, I was Y'all about to see me moonwalk right across in front. Through. Listen, I can apply this to, to today. There's some of you in here today, you're in direct disobedience to God. Oh, you're here, and I'm thankful. You know, that's part of obedience, just being in church where two or three are gathered together in my name. There will I be in the midst, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as manner some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. You're in church. Thank God. That's wonderful. Well, there's way more to the Christian life than just being in church. What did God deal with you specifically about? Some of you this week did not even, you haven't even prayed in the last two or three weeks about God, what would you have me give for my church? Haven't even prayed about it. God has dealt with you maybe in a couple areas and said, I want you to give this, oh Lord God, I, how in the world would I do? I don't know. Trust Him. He just saved you. He just healed you. 
You're not the same person as you were, and you'll trust Him for that, but you won't trust Him for your future. That does not make one dab of sense to me. You want to tell everybody, oh, well, you know, ain't I supposed to go out and tell people? Not if Jesus told you not to. He didn't tell them to ever tell somebody. He told them to go straight to the temple. We can't even follow the first step. We struggle at the first step. You know what the first step is after salvation? Listen to me. Baptism. We had a baptismal pool here last week and baptized a convert. I thank God for that. But if you've never been, in, you can't even follow the Lord in believer's baptism, but yet you want to... You've not even made it to first base when it comes to being a disciple. Well, I know it's in there about giving offerings and stuff, but uh, preacher, I'll just give my time. Some of you ain't even give time. By the way, that's not even scriptural. You, you've not even made it to first base. And I'm not getting on to you, but I'm getting on to you. You're not in obedience. How? Listen, it, there's nothing... I, I love this church. I love you. Please don't un misunderstand me. I'm trying to help you say... What should I do, Lord? I've been, I've been wandering out here. I've not really grown in the Lord. I just come ever so often when it's convenient or I'll come on Sunday and do my little thing. But are you a disciple? Are you obedient? Are you obeying so that others can be healed? So, so where does this apply to me today? I, this ties in so perfectly. What if everybody in here was obedient? What if? You think we'd have to struggle to pay off a debt? What if, Brother Kenya, we had a building out there big enough to house more people? Could others not be healed? Oh, well, I'm content. What's wrong with this? It's God's will we go forward. That's already been confirmed. We're going forward whether you're with us or not. But how many more people could be touched by the Master if you and I left today and said, all right, Lord, I want some others to get in this. It's not just about me. See, that was a selfish thing. Look at me. I got healed. I'm just going to go tell everybody. I don't care what Jesus has to do. And guess what Jesus had to do? He had to leave. I don't want Jesus to leave this church. There's some people that's left that I'm, I'm kind of glad they did. That's one person that I don't want to leave this church. If He leaves this church, I'm right behind Him. You'll know it, by the way. You'll know it when He leaves. He's here today. Because somebody's obedient. There's somebody's that's obedient. It ain't, it ain't, it ain't about me. Somebody's been praying. Somebody's been working. Somebody's been, God, we cannot lose Your presence. Hey, I told you this past Wednesday, I preached in a church Sunday morning. Or I didn't preach in a church. I preached in a church Monday and Tuesday night in Georgia. And this man said, I mean, huge auditorium. Huge. I wish we had that now. It seat four or five hundred people. Huge. About forty people. He said, Pastor, years ago, this place was filled. It was the church in this county. He said, man, I'm telling you, preacher, it's a struggle. Can you imagine? Church, auditorium, four or five hundred people, and you're preaching about forty people? And they only reminisce about what used to be? Guess, and by the way, this preacher, he's a great guy, and I think he's going to do some good things. But there's a fear that God is no longer there. Hey, we had good services, but can I tell you, hey, I left that night, Tuesday night, I left and I said, Lord, whatever it takes, I don't want that to be Bible Baptist Church. I don't want that to be our church. I want God to do something here. He has touched this church. He has healed this church. Let's go on. Let's, do, let's be obedient. I'm telling you right now, if you'll trust what the Word of God says, Family after family after family will too be touched. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads this morning. Very, very, very somberly, very quickly.